adventure, sports, outdoors. With host, Harry Canterbury. There I was, back in the wild again. And I fell right at home, where I belong. I had that feeling coming over me again. Just like it happened so many times before. Hi, Harry Canterbury with another edition of Adventure Sports Outdoors. Join us today as we take a bucket list flight on a B-17 bomber from World War II. And it's called the Aluminum Overcast. And it was quite a trip to fly in an old bird that's uh, 75 years old, but she still flies great. The uh, Experimental uh, Aircraft Association takes care of this plane and they take it all over the United States so folks like you and I can take a look at it. And it was quite an experience. We also uh, lost a good friend a few weeks ago, uh, Bob Big Bird Falkingham. Big Bird was his name. He was about six foot six. He was a big guy and had a big heart. Uh, well loved, well respected, and well thought of. Bob was a fighter and he fought this cancer for a long time like any Marine would. And uh, he never complained. He just kept on going. He was a great guy, well respected, well loved, and uh, just uh, very well admired, a great fellow. Uh, we've got a little piece from last year we uh, have from an interview we did on his experiences in Vietnam. And the U.S. Marine Veterans Motorcycle Club here in Pekin, Illinois, um, escorted the uh, hearse to the cemetery and is a very moving tribute to a great friend, Robert Big Bird Falkingham. You'll be missed, old buddy. Adventure Sports Outdoors is brought to you in part by Corsall Lumber, manufacturers of quality hardwood products, buyers of standing timber in Smithfield, Central Pool Supply, everything from pools to pool tables and much more in Peoria on West Pioneer Parkway, Kelleher's Irish Pub and Eatery, located on Peoria's Riverfront, open 11 a.m. daily, Eastport Marina, one of the only marinas in its class between Chicago and St. Louis, on Mariner's Way in East Peoria, and by Goodwill of Central Illinois. Free employment and veteran and youth services made possible because you donate. Our thanks to all of these sponsors. Kenny and I got to go out to Byerly Aviation in Bartonville at the uh, airport and we're really surprised to uh, see this B-17 called the Aluminum Overcast. And the reason it was aluminum, they quit painting these airplanes because they're put on too much weight and they wanted, it was lead paint, and they wanted to uh, carry more bombs. So later in the war, paint was uh, a no-no. But to see this old bird, 75 years old, purring on the runway there at the Peoria Airport was quite a moving experience. What did it cost to build this in dollars at that time? I'm gonna guess it, it cost a million dollars to build one of those. 225,000. To a quarter of a million, basically, to build that plane. To build this airplane. And in today's money, that would be like four, four and a half to seven mil. Seven mil today's money. To get an airplane, plug, what we call plug and play. Yeah, and you're, and you're telling me that 60% of these were either got shot up or went down, uh, mid air collision Same. and training accidents. accidents. It goes on and on. And so right now there's about 26 of these airplanes sitting in museums. 26. Sitting in museums. Of those, there's only 14 that actually fly. And of those, only four or five that do the living history uh, flights that EA does, Collins Foundation, the CAF, Commemorative Air Force, and other other entities. And you're one of the pilots? I'm one of the pilots. I fly this airplane in the, in the Memphis Bell. I'm also a pilot for the Memphis really? Bell. Really? The movie airplane now. The movie they made in yeah, the mid-90s. Yeah, I've seen it many times. Yeah, it's in Geneseo, New York. It's with the National Warbird Foundation, yeah. National Warbird Museum out there, and that's uh -huh. in Geneseo, New York. 
Yeah, yeah. So, yeah. so that's the uh, that is the, uh, uh, the Memphis Bell, the, what they made the movie on. But everybody wanted to fly the 17. He did. The reason why is survivability. You've seen the pictures of the nose being blown off, cut in half. And oh, yeah. It's survivability. And that's where the term came, if it ain't Boeing, we ain't going. That's where that term <laughs> oh, came really? from. There's a lot of other terms you're going to figure out here as we go along. So so now, you know the Ford Trimotor, right? Oh, yeah. I, I okay. almost flew Flown one. In. Okay. Yeah. Do you know it has a corrugated wing? Okay, but those all that corrugation outside makes the airplane real slow. It looks like a flying barn. Exactly. So what Boeing did and their designers, it's a corrugated wing, but it's turned upside down. The corrugations on the inside makes it double strong, so they put rivets on the outside to have a smooth wing. So that's how they can get the altitude and get their speeds. Right. And there was a lot of development. They went through over 400 changes on the airplane. 400. They had it first of all. They had they had less powered engines when they first designed it, and then they went. Now they finally ended up with the Pratt, uh, the right. I'm sorry, the right 1820. Now, who made the engines on this? Follow me. Okay. <laughs> so during the war. Wright couldn't supply all the engines, so they contracted Studebaker, a car maker. Now, Studa, this is an original World War II engine, and, and to get real close, you'd have to wipe it off, but it does say Studebaker on it. All right, there's parts of this airplane. My, we got another one over here. All right, let's look at this one over here. All right. So we had parts made by Revco, Patco, uh, General Motors made parts. Each landing gear on di different products were made by either General Motors or Ford had parts on the airplane. Now, the funny thing about it, who made the airplane? This is not a Boeing airplane. This is a Lockheed Vega airplane. All the G models were made by Lockheed Vega or Douglas Aircraft. They were Boeing's competitors during the war, but since the latter part of the war, Boeing could not, could not keep up with the demand, and also they were building the B-29. They had to go to the competitors. How would you like to get in there, Norm? <laughs> You'd fit in there pretty good. <laughs> During the war, I would have been on tail. Well, first of all, 250 cows, about about 1,000 rounds each they had. Bulletproof glass uh -huh. and armor plated. Okay, right. Safest place to be on an airplane. Really? Safest place. Now, to get in there, Wow. You couldn't be much bigger you, than me. You have to be a little bitty guy to get now, in. Now, I have gotten in, I've gotten in there. Really? And I've operated it. It does work. No we kidding. We don't allow anybody to do it in flight. No, my wow. goodness. This is the uh, position of the operator. So he's, uh, his feet are yeah. up here. Yeah. And he lays kind of on his back. Of the, yeah. Now, during part of the war, we lost a lot of B-17s because we didn't have the fighter escorts. They couldn't go as far until the Mustangs came, you know, the Red Tails. And, uh, Tuskegee. But Tuskegee Airmen helped out, and then they started mud But each machine gun, now the F model B-17, the waist gunners were opposite each other exactly. Now you'll see on this, when you get inside, they're offset because they were getting in each other's way. All right, back on the tail section of the B-17, the G model. You notice fabric. Fabric. Fabric ailerons, okay? Flaps are metal. Ah, rudder, fabric. You fabric see that? Rudder. Fabric, why? You get a round go through this thing, it goes right through it. If it's metal, it gets in there, it gets all jammed up, it's spreads hardware. out, you could have flight controls jammed. <laughs> We're in the aft portion of the B-17, the G model here, and this is where the, most of the activity usually happens with uh, fighter control. We have uh, two 50-cal machine guns, each with about 1,000 rounds. And each of these things earlier, Glenn mentioned that uh, this belt this belt feed uh -huh. was, uh, as I mentioned earlier, a lot of different people made parts on the airplane, a lot of different corporations. Lionel Train Company, who made tracks, made this belt feed. Makes sense. Uh -huh. Yeah, and then the 50-cal here, and the guys would, sing this and they swing around. Now the F model, this window was right here with this window and they got in the way. You see that? How right. they get in the way. So they offset it some. So they, they'd sit here and they spend a lot of time here like this. They have a sight and they're taught to lead the aircraft and things like that. And altitude affects the velocity of the round too. Okay. It goes a little bit quicker at altitude because the air is less dense. 
Yeah. So this whole thing was filled with roughly a thousand rounds, maybe 800. And you'd hear Tommy back here saying, hey, uh, Captain, I gave him the whole nine yards because this belt is 27 feet long, nine yards. That's, That's where that term came from. That's yeah. where it came from. And at altitude, it got real cold up here. So they wore those heavy uh, goat skin mm -hmm. and leather stuff. They also had heated suits. And if you look around right behind you here, on the wall here is an outlet. Yeah, that was to heat your suit. What's the temperature up there? Oh, minus 60, minus 40, depends on the day. Minus 60. 60. Minus 40, yeah. It's pretty cool. Wow. Cold. They couldn't touch bare stuff with the, you know, stick, just, you know. It just burn you. Remember I read, uh, what was that movie, Christmas Story with the kid? Yeah, stuck <laughs> his tongue. tongue yeah, yeah, yeah. It's basically the same thing. So <laughs> you'll see these big tanks. These are oxygen tanks. Uh, they had oxygen and some of the stuff they have. Uh, uh, intercom systems here. Here's a seat plug in here, and they, this is where the oxygen would plug in, and the guys would use and things of that na nature. We're in the radio room of the B-17G, and this is where the radio operator would be, and he his responsibility was to make communications, uh, sending uh, telegraph uh, as stuff as necessary. There would also be a machine gun right above our head here, aiming to the back of the airplane, and that would he could use that in combat but this is where it is, then this would open up in flight. In flight, it'd be closed to prevent rounds from straying and all that. And from here, we're going to go from the radio room, we're going to go through the bomb bay. Little bitty guy. Yeah, have a seat. Can you get through? Look at these ships. Come on in, old buddy. Here, can you get in? This is the, uh, this is the cockpit of the B-17. This is my wow. office. We switch off left and right. This is all original gauges. Now, almost all original. This is a, a GPS, a global positioning system. Mm -hmm. They didn't have, well, actually they had those in World War II, but guess what, they were black and white. No, I'm just kidding. So this is, uh, this is in the nose compartment. This is where the bombardier stays. And the navigator, he sits on this table here and they do that. Uh, the bat wings right there, those are the control, the chin turret. The chin turret that's below here with uh, two twin 50 cows. We have two twin 50 cal, uh, uh, 50 cal up here. So a lot of smoke and a lot of rock and rolling going up here when they're shooting at aircraft before they get ready. And when they get ready to start ready to bomb, the bombardier is turned around. He's got his head down in that Norton, that Norton bomb site behind you, mm -hmm. if, if you can. I can see you it can right see here. see it right there. Yeah. And then the other, the navigator may be here helping firing, or he may be over on one side with the bat wings trying to fire. Okay, so now you have a 19, 20 year old kid in combat at 25,000 feet, cold as hell outside, trying to fly a formation of 1,200 bombers over the right place and drop the bombs. Some 
I need to ask you this question. A lot of people are very curious uh, about who you are, what you've done in the past, and can you give us a, not a long bio, but an idea of, of your life and what you've done to get to where you are today? Well, uh, I was born and raised in Miami, uh -huh. and I've been right next to Miami International Airport, and uh, I, I've been around aviation all my life. My aunt was one trip secretary for Pan American. Wow. So when I was 10 years old, I, I met him, and he called me Little Sean. He said, Little Sean, you come to me at 18 with a commercial instrument, multi-engine rating, I'll make you a Pan American pilot. <laughs> at 18? At 18. Well, wow. I should have done that, but yeah. I didn't. I went in the military. Uh -huh. uh, we went in the U.S. Army, flew helicopters, Blackhawks. Uh, uh, I was in the cab. I was a cab Aero Scout pilot. You yeah. know, the guys that wore the, sure. the sabers and the, oh, yeah, the, and blue the, hat. And the, and the hats, yeah. you know, smell of, smell of jet fuel in yeah. the morning. Yeah. <laughs> so I did that and got out of the Army and then went to work for the government as a Department of Defense, uh, uh, Department of Army civilian instructor in Houston, Texas. Uh -huh. I was there for about a year, and one of my duties was to keep one astronaut current in a UH-1 helicopter. His name was Bob Crippen, the first shuttle commander. Wow. So I flew with Bob quite a bit. Now, I was a glider pilot, too. Really? So I got some time in the space shuttle simulator down at Ellington Field with NASA. <laughs> so I kind of did that. And then uh, about a year later, I got on with U.S. Customs and chased drug smugglers for 20-some-odd years, wow. retired in 2004 and uh, flew Blackhawks and all kinds of unique airplanes. My last five years, I flew the P3, the Lockheed Electra, uh -huh. the uh, AEW version. And then from 2004 to 2013, I did special contract work in Iraq and Afghanistan, working for people like Stan McChrystal, General McChrystal. Uh, we provided support, ISR, intelligence, surveillance, and reconnaissance from the air. You, you were contracted after, okay. Yeah. yeah. And between all that, from 1984 through now, I'm a pilot examiner for the FAA, and I do uh, all kinds of ratings in airplanes, helicopters, and gliders, and certification. And uh, Hey, well, thank you very much. Yes, we really for appreciate coming it. Out. I mean, it was uh, just yeah. fabulous. Thank you. Hi, I'm Dave Barth with your Sportsman's Tip of the Week. Many guys and gals are cowboys at heart, and everybody likes to shoot a cowboy rifle. 
And today we have a few examples of some of those guns. We're gonna start first with trapdoor spring fills. This is an officer's model, and it's a current production. Then we have the rifle version, and then we have the cavalry model, which is just identical just about to what Custer had at the Little Bighorn. They shoot a 4570, there's a single shot. You put the hammer on half cock, you open the loading gate, you drop your round in, close it, cock it fully, and you're ready to go. And then we jump up into lever action rifles, and um, these are Uberti, and they're exact copies of Winchester 73s. This is a saddle ring carbine. This is a deluxe rifle. And then we Winchester started making them. They're made by Maruku, but they have the Winchester name, octagon barrel, and this is a full-size rifle. If you want something a little bigger, Winchester comes out with uh, limited edition models. This is a Winchester 1886. Right behind that is the famous Yellow Boy carbine. It's a Winchester 66 copy. It's made by Uberti. This is a copy of a Winchester 92 carbine. It's made by Rossi. This particular rifle is in a 44 Magnum. If you're a big John Wayne fan, they make the John Wayne rifle. This is a 4440, the large loop, just like what he carried in most of his movies. And here's a nice example of some American-made rifles. These are made in New Jersey by the Henry Company. And if you want to do some long-range cowboy shooting, here's an example of a Sharps rifle. This is made by Shiloh Sharps. It's a 45 110 Probably the most common caliber in a Sharps these days is 45 70 And uh, this particular rifle is a special order. It's got the shotgun butt plate, uh, high-grade wood, factory installed uh, peep sight, and a extra heavy barrel. I'm Dave Barth with your Sportsman's Tip of the Week. Good shooting. Now we're gonna say goodbye to a good friend of ours, Robert Bob Falkingham, uh, better known as Big Bird. Quite a guy, well-loved, well-respected, and a great Marine. And uh, now we're gonna pay a tribute to such a fine man. So I went in February 28th, 1969. Uh, got out of boot camp. Well, I, I went to uh, radio school. I was a field radio operator, 2531. And then uh, we got off the plane, and uh, just the stench was the first thing that, that grabbed you. You could tell you was in a third world nation, and things weren't as fresh and crispy as they were back, back home. And uh, I remember, too, they were burning the, the, the diesel and the in the waste, yeah, yeah. In the, back then, and uh, so that was my indoctrination to uh, Vietnam. It was October 6th, 1969. I went over. So, where did you go? Where was your first? Uh, the next first day, duty? they uh, assigned me to 7th Marines, LZ Baldy, and I uh, got reassigned to LZ Ross, 3rd Battalion. And so, we got back in a convoy the next day. and off to Ross we go, and uh, we go in once a week to get a haircut. They had two barbers in there, and these guys look like VC at night. And I never did trust, because at the end of the haircut, they'd take a straight razor and they'd shave you. And the last time I, I went in there, before I went on my first big operation, I was the only one in there, and I had my 45 locked and loaded under your in there because I thought was, <laughs> if he's gonna cut me he, he's going to he's going to <laughs> well lo and behold that we did go out on an operation it was a 45 day operation in the place on mountains and uh, we got overrun in the fighting holes that I watched holes five six and seven that was signed to H and S company is where they came in they came through the Constantine wire and they killed seven Marines. Everyone had their throat slit. And the guy they called in the Constantine wire dead the next day was that barber. For real? Yeah.
Adventure Sports Outdoors is brought to you in part by Corsall Lumber, manufacturers of quality hardwood products, buyers of standing timber in Smithfield, Central Pool Supply, everything from pools to pool tables and much more in Peoria on West Pioneer Parkway. Kelleher's Irish Pub and Eatery, located on Peoria's riverfront, open 11 a.m. daily. Eastport Marina, one of the only marinas in its class between Chicago and St. Louis, on Mariner's Way in East Peoria. And by Goodwill of Central Illinois, free employment and veteran and youth services made possible because you donate. Our thanks to all of these sponsors. Join us next month as we explore radio in Peoria, Illinois. In 1927, WMBD Radio went on the air. And uh, we're also going to go to uh, Jerry Scott's home in Pekin, Illinois, who has a massive collection of old antique radios. It's going to be a very interesting program. And uh, we'll see you next month. <laughs>